On the build show today, I've got master builder Brian Euler up in Washington State that's going to give us the 411 on concrete footings, including how much it actually costs to pour out the footings on that particular job. Today's build show featuring Brian all about footings. Let's get going. Today, we have a brand new project that we're starting, and I can't wait to go through the details on this footing. We're gonna get into the structural side of things and even the safety side. Let's get into it. All right, so for a very high level view, what we have is a single bay garage here, double bay garage there. Incidentally, we won't have a post, so it'll be nice and open. Then back in that area, for the most part, it's a two story, and that'll be on a crawl space. But we're gonna get into the footing today. The footing is absolutely critical. If you really wanna go behind that, you wanna make sure that you get your grade that your footing is gonna be poured on pretty level. And so here, you can see that we're pretty decent. We do have some of our uh, foundation forms lifted a little bit, but why don't you come on over and I'll show you some of the steel. So here you can see that there is a lot of steel work going on. This rebar here, we actually have three lengths of it, but on this side, well, it, it's three for a while, but then it shoots down to two. This has to be a special area. Even the thickness of the concrete is way thicker on the front side than it is over here. The reason for that is these are garage portal frames, and so you've got these huge mammoth openings, and you're gonna still have to resolve your structural forces, and so you do that with the heavier continuous footing, and then you end up having heavier shear walls, which of course you can't see as it is in here. Another thing to point out is we have these pre-bent angle bars that come around. You can bend things on site, but I mean, just think about it. Even though this is only number four bar, if you have three bends for this corner, three bends for that corner, and you multiply it all the way throughout the whole foundation, that's a lot of work. And that is man or woman work, as the case might be. It's way more difficult. One tip is see if your rebar supplier can just supply pre-bent corners. You might wanna look at your structural engineer detail, consult with your uh, engineer, just to make sure that you're getting the development that you want for how far that overlap is. I was talking to Steve Basic Architects and uh, his engineer has a specific amount that he wants an overlap, even if it was a 100 foot long building and you've got a bunch of horizontal 20 foot sticks, you still want a certain amount of overlap there so that the concrete can really develop that strength around it. So anyway, make sure that your angles aren't just 90 degree bends, but that you're getting the right distance that you want on that. A Couple of other things that you can see is we have these pre-tied in. This vertical steel will eventually have the concrete walls that get set up on each side for the formwork. There will be horizontal bar that comes from, uh, goes across this bar. The concrete will cast around that and all of this will behave as if it's one unit. But this has to come in at this point of the construction, ties into the bar here, and you can see how all of that interlocks together. Now this bar is taller. The reason for that and if we look down there, you'll see another corresponding tall bar. This is the U for ground. So you have to think so far ahead when it comes to concrete. We have this in here, so the electrical contractor will set their meter base in this area. It'll be a back-to-back -back meter on the outside, panel on the inside, and they can, I don't know if the right term is bond or ground. I'm pretty sure grounding is the right term. Um, their panel to this system and it will be grounded throughout the entire uh, rebar structure, which is pretty cool. So you've got this height for this stick of bar, this height, which will be taller than the finished concrete wall elevation. <laughs> but then over here, you've got a separate height. And the reason for that is because of these concrete portal walls that are gonna be built in here. One other thing we can look at, well, maybe two things while we're here it's uh, like Bill Cosby's old joke, you know you're old when you get down to tie your shoes and you look around and say, hey, what else can I do while I'm here? 
So same thing, what else can we do while I'm here? This is, uh, on the design, these were 15 by 7 inch footings. Well, unfortunately, the engineers can come up with what they want for the sizing, but then in the real world, and I don't mean that to sound disparaging to uh, engineers, what size clips can you actually purchase? These end up with a 16 inch, so we've got a little bit more concrete than we're going to need, but that's just the reality. And then we have 7 inch deep footings. These are 2 by 6 forms, 2 by 6 nominal, 5 and a half inch in reality. So you have to add a couple of inches in order to get that 15 by 7, which will actually be 16 by 7. Uh, something else that we have is these rebar caps. Probably should have thrown one on here. It is what it is, but that's to, uh, number one, satisfy safety requirements, but also impalement. It's so easy. When you're working in concrete to be tripping over something, and before you know it, you've got a rebar rod sticking through you. If that ever happens, don't pull it out. Just a little tip of the trade there. And then I think we already talked about it, but this is a deeper footing. When you do construction, always think in terms of elevations. Sometimes that might be on a horizontal or a vertical datum, but in this case, we had two choices. We could have dug the subgrade deeper, which would have allowed this footing to be the same distance all the way around, or you can elevate part of it. So thinking in terms of elevating what you can pop in and pop out is a good skill to have. All right, let's head over, and I want to show you where a point load is coming in. Okay, what we're going to talk about here is why this is bucked out, the mat that we have, and uh, yeah, the, really the reason why. So in this case, we're going to have a post come down, a column, and that is to support the ridge beam that's going to be in the garage. So Timmy hand stacks his roofs. You might see in other areas on here, we do have some other point loads. So we'll have a column coming down and now we have this grid that was designed by the engineer and what that will do is act monolithically with the concrete and collect all of the weight or at least half of the weight of that roof maybe more but anyway won't get into the details on the mathematics into this location to collect all of that force and transfer it into the earth just think in terms of numbers i don't know what this is 36 maybe by 24 so think you do 36 inches by 24 inches, there's a certain amount of square inches of contact with the ground. Now compare that if this was that 15 by 7 that we talked about. The more you can evenly distribute your load over the larger area, the less pounds per square foot, or convert that to pounds per square inch, will actually be resting on the soil. Um, one other thing just to think about, the reason we're putting the rebar in is because concrete acts good in compression, but not particularly good in tension. So this helps to increase the tensile strength of the entire assembly here. Then over here, these are, this is a little tip that we picked up just a couple of years ago. These are called dobies, at least that's what we call them. They're just chunks of concrete that helps to elevate your, um, your rebar off the soil, because you do want the concrete to fill underneath your rebar. And of course, those have the compressive strength that you're looking for instead of just putting something else under there. Uh, so that works out well for that. Now, as we come along here, I'm stepping into the crawl space. So there's going to be a floor diaphragm somewhere up in this world. And this will be a post and beam construction for the most part. Some of it, however, and I don't know if this is one of them, but for the purposes of this video, it is. <laughs> This is actually going to be a shear wall. So from the footing, we're going to have a wood frame shear wall that will tie into the floor diaphragm. There will either be a joist sitting over the top, or if the joists run perpendicular, there will be blocking. That will be nailed into this wall. And then there will be a wall above it. That too will have sheathing on it. And that, I believe in this case, might get transferred all the way up until the, the rafters. But we're only talking about the foundation, and that's months away. I don't need to put a whole lot of thought into that. We're high seismic design category D2 here in Washington State, where we're building. So that's part of why we have to think so much about the seismic restraint side of things. But if we can keep all of this 
in our minds at this phase, every step from here on out is going to go easier. And you can see part of that because we talked about the electrical. So already we're thinking in terms of electrical distribution on this house. It translates into the site, how we're going to get the electrical distributed from the uh, utility company routed through here. Really, we want to be a big picture builder. And the more that we can integrate into our minds, the more we can serve our subcontractors when they're on site, instead of dumping everything on their minds. They're not going to know all of the things that, in my opinion, a good builder should know in order to be that facilitator for everyone else. One last thing and then we'll wrap up. Somewhere in this area is where we're going to have our sewer, sanitary sewer discharge. And then of course we'll maintain our separation, but the water line is going to come in. So if we were doing a video at the uh, wall stage, the foundation wall stage, we would show you what we put in as far as the sleeve. We're gonna have a three inch waste come out. We'll have a four inch sleeve cast into the concrete. We'll have probably inch and a quarter water line coming in, but just to be safe, we're gonna have a two inch sleeve for that water line uh, to be able to slide through. Then we'll waterproof it and all that's done. A Little bit of math that needs to be in, uh, done to make sure that I've got my fall in here with where all of that goes. Make sure we're not hitting the rebar, but that's about it. Um, I was just talking to Steve Basic, and uh, one of my favorite quotes is, there's five ways to do things, one of them is wrong. This is how we do it. Uh, there's many other ways to do it, but if you think through it methodically, consult with other people, you'll find on something that works for you and your company. So the concrete truck hasn't shown up yet. There's going to be three total, but basically it's all about conveyance, trying to get materials from one place to another. So what they're going to end up having is a chute that comes in here. They're going to pour the concrete in there. This is called a hopper. And it's going to end up coming out through the hose and then they'll be able to place it. Now in the past we would tailgate and honestly, if this site allowed for it, we still would. You're basically paying for a machine to be on site to move that liquefied concrete from one place to another. All of those little things add up. Should be having concrete here before too soon. One new thing that's pretty cool is my brother actually gets a text message from the batch plant when they start batching the concrete. So that helps us to know how long the concrete has been, uh, you know, in the, in the drum before it gets here. But it also just kind of lets us know when we should be expecting the concrete truck. All right, any minute now, I hope to see the rig driving up the driveway. All right, we got our first truck here, and one of the first orders of business is kind of a project manager could be getting your ticket. So just to walk through with you, this is six and a quarter yards, a six sack, three eighths inch aggregate, 60 40 uh, with air. And I don't mind showing you the numbers here. Uh, about 1200 bucks for this first load. And uh, so far, so good. Now I want to kind of see how things are running, and I'm going to head over there. All right, here they are conveying the concrete like we talked about. So they're putting the vertical rebar up, and so far, so good. It's a stiff enough mix that it's not really spilling out the bottom. Step over here, give you a better view. And before you know it, that truck is going to be all emptied. There will be another one coming in. Okay, we just got done pouring out our first truck. We've got the second one here. It's divided up into six yard loads. Um, each truck could hold 10 yards, but we have smaller loads, which I think in this case was a good play. We just have a new driveway. Didn't know how it was going to play out. So far, it hasn't been any kind of a problem. Um, anyway, so they're just kind of working their way through. One other thing is I did get a bucket of water. If you're pouring concrete and you don't have water on site yet, you can talk to the guys who bring the concrete on site. And they might have some water to give you, and that allows you to keep your tools nice and clean. Okay. I think I've filmed long enough. Let me get back to it. All right, we are between trucks. We had 18 yards total ordered. We all think we're gonna be short, so the last one is bumped up to seven yards. Still might be a little short, but we can make up for that in the walls. I wanted to talk to you about three pieces of equipment to think about if you're gonna be doing concrete. 
This is a resin float from Cadillac Concrete Products. Back in the day, the old timers used to use wood floats. This is nice for pushing right at the beginning, like a large aggregate. So at the beginning, you shape it pretty close and then you might use a mag float. We don't steal trowel. This is all getting covered up eventually. It doesn't need to be pretty. These Zenni optical glasses, these are prescription. It was, took a little bit of work to be able to do it because I've got astigmatism, but they're a Z87-2 plus. So now I'm safe as far as my eyes are concerned. You will get concrete spatter if you're anywhere near the concrete being placed. And then the last thing is these gloves. Waterproof gloves. I think I had talked about um, the bucket. I've already cleaned this up once. It is just nice having your skin dry and not be, uh, you know, soaked in water. Then you can clean it as much as you want. Hopefully we'll have our truck here within just a few minutes and we'll finish this guy out. And that is a wrap. We just poured about 20 yards of concrete. We were a little bit shy. Probably shouldn't have used the resin float due to the size of the footing. It actually was a little bit more trouble than it was worth. Lesson learned, life is all about learning. Next, the forms will get stripped, then the walls will get set, get an inspection, and then we'll come back in with some more concrete. Guys, big thanks to my friend Brian Euler for giving us this 411 on footings. If you don't know Brian, he and his brother Tim are actually building the houses. They're out on the job sites on a daily basis, and Brian's in-house crew does most of the concrete work, does all the framing, all the cornice, all the siding, these are really, really seasoned builders that on a regular weekly basis, Brian is sharing his wisdom from 30 years in the industry, plus all the years he grew up doing it as well. So I'm super thankful to have Brian. Uh, a lot of times he's known as Pioneer Builders. That's actually his Instagram handle. But Brian Euler, fabulous builder, and he's been with us now for about three years sharing his wisdom. So if you want to see more of Brian's videos, go over to our website, thebuildshow.com. On the top, you'll see a little hamburger menu, like three lines. Click that, and then you'll see Build Experts. Hit that button, the drop-down list, Brian Euler. He's towards the bottom because it's alphabetical, and you can see all of Brian's past content from the last three or four years that he's been on the Build Show. That being said, guys, hit that subscribe button below. We've got new content here every Tuesday and every Friday. Follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on the Build Show.